for talking. What's going on? Thank you guys for coming. I know that this is a tricky time of day. A lot of you trying to balance a lot of different things. So if you have to have your camera off, that's fine. If you're able to be on with us, it would just be so lovely to see your faces, but I'm going to ask just to make sure we're on and um, we keep it smooth presentation and recording for everyone that we just um, put ourselves on mute until we're ready to, to open up the discussion part, which I want to make sure we make time for. Cool. Good to see your faces. Hello, Teresa. I see Eric Cornell is here. Diana, Trevor, Stacy. Thank you guys. It is no small thing for you to give up time in the middle of your damn day. And I am excited to make it worth it. Let's do it. All right. I'm going to, I promise, not drag you kicking and screaming through a, a PowerPoint presentation, but I think it's going to be helpful for us to have some visuals too. And yeah, totally. Eric for the win. Like what on brand? What? What? He's got an Emerson Week background. I don't even have that. I have a room separator that I got at Wayfair. What? Okay, cool. So let's jump in. Boom. This is where you are. This is where I hope you're wanting to be. If you were looking for intro to French, it's down the hall. Uh, this is part one of Unmute Yourself, how to be heard on Zoom and in life. Uh, my name is Terry Jaspicio. I earned my MFA uh, in 1897 uh, from Emerson College um, in poetry, which is more practical than you might think. Um, I'm also the, the proud host and co-creator with Rebecca Glucklich of Making It Big in 30 Minutes, which is the Emerson Alumni Podcast. If you haven't checked it out, please do. Well, let's jump in here because it really is um, one thing to speak up. And if Emersonians know one thing, it's how to speak up. I'm not worried about you all being able to speak your mind, but it's another to be heard. And that is the challenge, isn't it? Because we know we have things to say, but we, you cannot make someone listen any more than you can make someone do something, right? It, real hard to do. And so that's not, that's not the point. We can't, we're not here to make people, but even the, the most extroverted or confident among us will hit walls with people who, quite frankly, make it difficult. Here is our own, uh, her own vice president who not that long ago had to hold her own against the person she was running against in the vice presidential debates when Kamala Harris had to, this is the moment. This is, I, I watched it and I screenshot, you know how many screenshots I took to try to get this one moment? of the moment right before she says to Mike Pence, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. And I'm sorry, we are gonna get gender here for a sec. It is different when a woman has to tell a man to shut up, please, I was in the middle of saying something, right? That's not easy to do for anyone, but in particular, look at we were, what we were looking at here, is that she didn't wanna be like, excuse me, shut up. I mean, you know, you can't, uh, there's, there's a million things she was trying to do here. And this is about the highest stakes you can get. We are not every day dealing with this level of high stakes, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. Now, this isn't just about women but I have research that highlights the gender disparity, which is a good place to start to see why. Speaking online, like we will do forever, I don't care how much the world comes back to how it was, we are going to be virtually presenting for a very long time. It's gonna be now not an only if and worst case scenario, but part of what we do. And so listen to this, this is before all this happened in 2019, Women in the Workplace Report. Okay, McKinsey and LeanIn.org surveyed 329 companies and more than 68,000 employees. Half the women surveyed have been interrupted and talked over in meetings. Around 40% watched other people take credit for their ideas. Does that mean men are all bad and never not? No, of course not. This is 68,000 people they asked. So it's worth looking at, right? Deborah Tannen is a professor of linguistics at Georgetown. She's brilliant, has written so much about this. And she says, this one line, I think is something, if there's only one thing you, you write down and tweet, it would be communication isn't as simple as saying what you mean. Oh, if only, if only that's all it was, but it's not just that. Why is all of this harder online? 2019, they weren't talking about Zoom calls. They were talking about in general. 
why is being online even harder? Well, I mean, hello, you've been on in the planet, in the world, you know why it's harder, but let's just look at the reasons why. It's tougher to read the room, right? This is very meta because we're doing this right now. I'm looking at your faces right now. It is tougher to read the room, though not impossible. It's harder to break into conversation. Tech glitches and delays, miscues, we hear them, through, whoa, or hardware where I just knocked my computer off my desk. Sorry about that. Tech glitches and delays, things that make it harder, like glitches in the matrix that if they happen in real life, it would be like the world was off its axis, but that happens online. Also, we take up less room. Each of us is the size of a basically a postage stamp. So it is harder to have your presence felt. It's also easier to disappear and see what happens. Now, I know you're all trying to do a lot of things today, but see what happens when you're not present and, and you disappear right behind the thing. It is easier to disappear from Zoom than it is in a room. Try doing that. This is a snapshot of just a group I run uh, called the Six Week Sprint, where we get together and we write and we read our work to each other. Uh, it, it is about the most sweetheart of a group you could find. These are total sweethearts. They could not be more wonderful. But even this moment, you can see some people are looking down, away. Some people are right up on that camera. Some people are off in the background. The scale is all different and off. So that also makes it sort of weird, right? Now, here's a little bit about what we're going to do. And I'm going to take it off the slides for a second because I know that's hard when you're looking at slides and then they're covered and whatever. We're going to explore some tactics for, and strategies for being heard. Okay, we are going to do that. In part one, this is where we're going to focus. I'm going to do a lot of the talking in part one and then in part two, it's going to be different. We're going to shift and we're going to open it up a lot more. Though, of course, we're going to have time for questions, so don't worry. I just want to give you as much as I can so that we are all asking questions from the same place. Okay, so I'm not looking at the chat right now. If you're asking questions, I don't see them yet. I will call for them. We're also going to reframe some of the language we use around communication because the way we talk about communication matters, not just how we communicate. We're also going to tackle some of the awkwardness of online speaking. Yeah, it's awkward. Yup, we're going to deal with it. What we're not going to do is assume that this is a problem only women have because it's not. We're also not going to attempt to undo all of sexism, racism everywhere today. That's not our goal. And we can't say, well, we can't do anything because of sexism and racism. Nope, that's not true either. We're also not going to unanimously agree. Look, you're all Emersonians, most of you, right? And you have strong opinions about things. And so do I. And it's okay if you don't agree with me. I'm not here to make you think you have to think like me. My goal today is to kick open some new ways of seeing things so that you have more tools to draw on when you are speaking to people anywhere. Now, I am going to show you just a little trigger warning I had. This is not legal. It's not like legalese or anything like that. But I always want to make sure, right, because you can't talk about this stuff without having a little bit of triggery stuff. We are going to talk a little bit about gender. I realize not everyone identifies with one gender. I get that. It's complex. But we are going to speak in some broad strokes about how women and men are traditionally raised in Western culture and what studies have shown. This does not mean this is the only way people are raised. It doesn't mean that the way you were raised wasn't right or was abnormal. No judgment on that. It's just that I'm drawing from what's been published so that I cannot just, you know, have nothing to go on here. Okay, good. Now, where am I coming from here? Am I someone who's a DNI specialist? No, that is not my background. I graduated uh, from Boston College undergraduate, and as I said, Emerson for an MFA as a as a writer. And I've basically spent spent the first part of my career as a magazine editor and someone as a contributor in the media and someone who often interviews experts and distills their expertise in order to explain it to other people. And in some cases that that table turned and then I was the person who's being interviewed. It's a very weird world media. It's a world, a hall of mirrors as it were. Uh, for years, I also hosted a live radio show on Sirius XM for the Martha Stewart brand because that's that was my employer for many years. I was a magazine editor there. Today I work for myself and the simplest way to explain what I do and who cares is uh, I change the way people think about, talk about and communicate what they do. You might say that's a creative consultant or a messaging expert, eh, use whatever words you want. The point is when it comes to actually communicating a thing, that's my sweet spot. And that's why we're talking about this today. And I do that for, I'm industry agnostic, platform agnostic. It doesn't matter. You have something to say and you wanna get it to, into someone else's head, that's my job. 
I also uh, got some attention. The only thing I've ever done that anyone outside of my immediate circle has ever seen is this TED Talk. It has almost 7 million views. It's called Stop Searching for Your Passion. I really liked that dress. I can never wear it again. It's very unfortunate because now it's the only thing I have that 7 million people have seen. Moving on. Uh, this is probably the scariest thing I've ever done. The TED Talk was a little scary and fun, but I'm way more at home in front of a conference full of people. Stand-up comedy, scariest thing I ever did. Have done it. I've done it for years. I do not make my living from it, but uh, it is something that will teach you talk about speaking up and uh, to a surly audience who might not give a crap. Fact, men tend to be rewarded for standing out and showing status. Women tend to be rewarded for playing down their achievements. This is not a fact for in everyone's life true all the time, but this is a fact for how the world operates, which is why you're more likely to see a group of guys kind of like dunking on each other and making fun of each other and trying to be the big guy. Whereas you get a group of women together and, and you know, me and my friends, and I'll talk about how I don't like my hair and they'll tell me why it's so nice. You know, it's just, we tend to put our things down. That's, that's how we connect. It's not how maybe you connect all the time, but let's just work from that, from that general assumption. Catherine Heath, Jill Flynn, and Mary Davis Holt put together this piece three years ago. Uh, women find your voice. Um, and by the way, I'll tell you where to, I have all the links to all these things. And I'll tell you how to get those later if you're interested in reading more into this. Now I gotta, I gotta unshare here so I can read this thing. Here's a piece from that article. Women, uh, female executives, they said, vastly outnumbered in boardrooms and C-suites and with few role models and sponsors report feeling alone, unsupported, outside their comfort zones and unable to advocate forcefully for their perspectives in many high level meetings. Okay, that's what they found. They also found that more than a third of men indicated, more than a third, that when their female peers do speak up, they, those women fail to articulate a strong point of view. Half said that women allow themselves to be interrupted, they apologize repeatedly, and fail to back up opinions with evidence. Does that mean you don't have evidence? No, they didn't talk to you for this article, did they? They didn't talk to me either. But there is a trend here. Now we know that it's not always the friendliest place for women to speak up. And again, I know this isn't just about women, but let's understand the playing field here. Can you guess why women might not want to articulate a strong point of view? Because someone might disagree with them. Because it might be dangerous to be seen as disagreeing with you. And I think it's safe to say for all of human civilization, it, the one thing that's unsafe for women is to be seen. The minute they're seen, they are at risk. You don't think that has something to do deep, deep down in that primal zone uh, that we might be a little bit afraid of calling attention to ourselves when we disagree with some of the people in power, namely men? Of course. Now, we cannot change what people in general or men in particular think about how women act, speak, or behave. I'm not here to change someone's mind. I'm here to change how we act so we can get our points across, we women and men. Also, yes, things are getting better. There is awareness and a big push to support underrepresented leaders across the board. And Emerson is really at the fore of that, right? However, we can be thought we, we can be told that, oh, because there's metrics in place, there's, there's lots of look at, we, we check the boxes, we close the gender gap, or we close the pay gap, or there's a lot of companies that, that can lay claim to that. And I said, to, I've worked with one of those companies, and they said, we've already checked all those boxes. I said, that's great. And you know that that's not enough because metrics are like climbing anchors. Did you ever go rock climbing? I did once. It was thrilling. I haven't done it again. Not that I wouldn't, but it was terrifying. But you need to have the metrics in there, just like you need anchors in that rock. But just because the metrics are there doesn't mean that everyone feels secure. It means it's time to start climbing. Still scary. Doesn't mean you don't do it. Deborah Tannen again from Georgetown. Here's the key. Those who are comfortable speaking up in groups who need little or no silence before raising their hands or who speak out easily without waiting to be recognized are far more likely to get heard at meetings. And we're going to talk about that because the silence before you start speaking, if you're waiting for a big a boulevard of silence to open up, you'll be waiting a long time. Uh, you know, if you can speak out easily without waiting, 
these things matter. But I understand that speaking up can sometimes feel like a zero sum game. Why? Because what if you say something and people, you know, what if you say nothing, actually, if you say nothing at all, that's what people will think. Oh, not confident, insecure, forgettable, blah, blah, blah. But if you do say something, you could be thought of as these things, right? And that's the zero something I want to push against because it doesn't mean you're one or the other, but that's the fear. That's what we're dealing with. Seth Godin is, of course, a huge deal in the entrepreneur and marketing. And, and now he writes a lot about doing creative work. He has been a mentor of mine. And he said, oh, here's a bit, something for your presentation. He said, uh, he's received 500 audio submissions for his podcast, meaning you send him an audio submission. Hey, Seth, I have a question for you, like talking. 75 came from women out of 500. Women don't always speak up as much. So what's at stake? Oh, as we said, I might not be likable. It might hurt my chances. It may, uh, blah, blah, blah. These are the fears I have. Well, I would say something, but I want to upset this person, da, 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 da. Okay, fine. But what's really at stake? I understand the fears. I felt the same fears that anyone else has felt. I'm no different. The real stakes are that you could be overlooked and underestimated. You may stunt your own growth in an organization and anywhere. You may allow likable to trump impactful. You may opt to be like, liked, and then you may sacrifice impact. You may never realize your own potential. That is for Emersonians, the scariest of all, right? Uh, by the way, yes, this is where you should go before I forget. Um, Jenny, could you pop that into the chat so people can just click on it, it's just easier. This is where, when you click on this, it'll have, you don't have to do it now, but just you know, put it in there so you can do it in the next, today, because I'm gonna send out an email with all the resources and stuff that I'm referencing here. What this is about, and I want you to really think about this for a second, reputation versus representation. What will people say about me versus am I representing women? Am I representing my team? Am I representing people of color? Whatever it is, that representation has to be more important. We've been taught from the beginning that if we're nice and we're good and we're likable, good things will happen. But that's not how great things happen. And I know you know that. Do you want to make a pleasant impression? Or do you want to make an impact? And I know you, I know this crowd, and I know what, I'm going to guess what your answer is. You don't have to change who you are to be worth listening to. You don't have to change your personality. You don't have to all of a sudden be the joker if you're not a joker. You don't have to all of a sudden be bossy and coming in and being like all tough when you were never like that. No, 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 no. You can simply change tactics without changing your personality and the way you like to approach things. If you're soft-spoken, you never have to be anything but soft-spoken. Doesn't mean you can't be firm. So let's talk about interrupting for a second, because this by far is the question I got when I started, when I put together this initial presentation, I've given it other places. Uh, well, I don't want to, how do I do this without interrupting? The first part of this is talk like a pundit. Men have been doing this for ages, but they don't call it interrupting. They call it talking. Think about that for a second. What does interrupt even mean? It means to stop or break the continuity of, literally to stop things. Okay, do you have to stop the ocean in order to go swimming in it? Do you have to say, stop ocean, I'm trying to come in and cool off? No, you just get in it. You get in it, in all of its chop and churn, wherever the tides are. If you're waiting for this to happen, to start talking, oh, you'll be waiting a very long time, maybe forever. This is what we think has to happen in order for us to share in a meeting, in a gathering in person, and especially gathering online. Well, I need to wait till everyone stops talking in the waters part. Waters aren't parting anytime soon. I say this as one of the most critical points for today, because if you see your own contribution, potentially, to, to share something in a meeting. It doesn't even have to be a big thing. As interrupting, what you're assuming is that you're not part of the conversation. That's not true, is it? If you're invited to a meeting and you're sitting there listening and then you're going to say something, you're worried about interrupting. Do you want to interrupt a meeting? 
show up to a meeting that you weren't invited to and walk in with an air horn, just blare into the joint with an air horn. Yeah, now you're interrupting. Now you've successfully interrupted a meeting. But if you're already sitting there, you're not. A conversation is not a monolith. It's, it's an irregular, ongoing, living, unscripted thing. Conversations disrupt themselves. To think that you're going to come in and have to break the conversation, be part of it, that's, a, that's something in our heads. Yeah, people talk. There's waves of conversation, things lapping over each other all the time. You got to get in there. But you don't have to stop the flow of it to start swimming. You just get in there and you start swimming. And I'll show you how. A lot of it is about thinking rather than I need to part the waters and slam a sledgehammer on the table. No, think scalpel. Think precise and to get in there when you think it is most valuable. I know that it feels like this. It's like jumping into a game of double dutch, which I don't know if I've ever done that, but I get the idea and it is scary because the ropes are moving in two different directions and you're going to try to jump in. But what do you do? What is a good game of double dutch? You jump in, you jump for a little bit and you jump out. The idea is not how do I commandeer this meeting? It's how do I pop in, hop, 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 get out and keep moving. That's the idea to swim with. And as Dennis Morton says, a Peloton, if you wait until the time's right, you'll wait forever. No waiting. Um, so I, I really want to make that point clear here, because if you feel that and you go, well, I don't want to interrupt, what you're saying is that your two cents is, in, is, is somehow inferior, which is why it is shocking to me when um, uh, this next question that people give me. I find this very interesting. So if on one moment I'm like, oh, it, oh, oh, I can't, but I don't want to, mm. if I'm afraid of that, and then you say, well, then why don't you jump in? People say, oh, well, I'm afraid I'll come across as uh, aggressive. Aggressive? Let's look at those words a little more closely. Aggressive, the definition, ready to attack, to attack, attack. Let's look at what aggressive might look like. Oof, aggressive, aggressive, cute, but also aggressive. Oh boy. Yes. Very aggressive. Uh, that was one of the most aggressive actions we saw on national television. I mean, yeah, it was aggressive. She made her point. Now, what about assertive? Confident and direct. That's very different from ready to attack. I'd say she is a wonderful example of assertive. So is she. And so is she. People who've changed the course of history by being assertive. You can have an aggressive act and not be aggressive all the time. <clears throat> Participation does not equal aggression. We need to uncouple these things. People will think you're aggressive if you come in ready to cut someone. But, you know, I've, I've been told that I'm assertive by people who are glad about that and people who are not glad about that. Again, I, I choose my critics carefully and I disregard the rest, especially if I'm advocating for something that needs to be advocated for. So let's talk about some of the things you can try. Let's talk about how to do this. How do you do this? All these ideas are great. You got to give me some tools. I'm going to give you one tool that if there's one thing you stop doing from here to four, today forward, do not disclaim. It does not endear you. It's not effective. And it looks bad on everyone. What is claiming? Hmm. I just, I think, I don't know if, I'm not sure if anyone agrees with me, but maybe I'm alone here on this. Could you point to disclaiming anymore? Why are we stomping on our own contributions before we make them? It's a waste of time. It's a waste of breath. It does nothing to make people more confident in you. You're disclaiming and destroying your own confidence before you've even said a word. Oh, this is just my opinion. Well, I didn't think you were giving me the uh, king's opinion. Beware of how you use the words, I'm sorry. 
And I say this because there is also a gender distinction here that when I say to my friend, oh, this happened to me, I say a girlfriend, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. I'm sorry. That might be how me and my girlfriends and you and your friends or women, you know, relate or how you in intimate situations uh, show empathy. But if you say, I'm sorry, a lot in public in places that matter to you, you might start to look sorry. Sorry has undergone a lot of inflation. Don't contribute to that. Use sorry when you really mean it, but no other time. One way to do this is, you know, I'm, you don't want to be like, I'm apologizing before I even say, I'm sorry, but can I just, the friendly pause. If you need to jump in and Chris is talking, you're going to jump in. Here's the thing I've done in every conversation, broadcast conversations, meetings, whatever. Chris, hang on a second. I, I love what you just said. I don't want to move on too quickly from that. Here's why. Now, I hear, I love what you just said, Chris. I'm going to jump in here. Here's why. I want to make sure no one misses what you just said. Oh, guess who's shutting up? Chris, because he would love nothing more or she than for you to rebroadcast and amplify his or her genius in that moment. If you try cutting in to fight with people, they're going to get their backs up, but not when you're coming in to amplify. And luckily, you're usually talking to land animals. If you're talking to land animals, they need to take a breath. You don't need more than one breath's worth of a pause. Chris takes a breath and then, Chris, I just wanna stop you there for a second. I don't wanna move on too quickly, here's why. And then say why. Make your case. Make sure you know why you're interrupting. Ha ha, not interrupting, but kindly swimming along. Make your case. Don't shy away from a strong opinion. In fact, this is what makes people listen. When you soft pedal a thing, it shows that you're afraid. It shows that you're not sure. You don't have to be bombastic, but you can have a firm grip on your idea. For years, I contributed to the media, and then I trained experts to speak in the media. They, again and again, they, they, you know, you have to speak in a very short sound bites. I know a lot of you will work in the media, and you know this already. But what I would tell people is headline your point right away. What happens is if you're going to jump in when we were in the middle of a point, uh, get to it quickly rather than taking us down a rabbit hole because then there's tension. We're here, and you're going to go out this way down the street. No, no, no. Get very clear about what you're trying to say right now. Here's why I'm saying this present the shortest path to that point and let everyone stop and go, well, Andrea, what do you mean by that? Can you tell us more? Then you unfold that point as needed, but you don't need to explain everything in that little pocket, that air pocket that you grab for yourself. Uh, that's all you need to get in the point and let them ask you for more. And don't pretend you know something you don't. That's dangerous. It's just dangerous. But that leads us to our next question. People said to me, I'm afraid of saying something in case I'm not 100% correct. Really? Because we can just look at the last presidency to see that you can just say all kinds of things that aren't accurate and still be in charge. Um, that isn't to say that you want to emulate our last president. My point is, you don't have to be infallible to say something worthwhile. And you confident does not mean bloviate. It does not mean that you have to, well, come through my presentation like a siren, which of course is going to happen every few minutes here in the middle of Manhattan. But uh, calculators are hundred percent correct. You want to sit and have a conversation with a calculator? I don't. If you're going to have a conversation, it's with a leader, a thinker, someone who has insights and hunches and ideas. Leaders take risks. You can say, I don't have all the information, but my hunch is that da, 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 da. And I'd love to follow up about this later. You can say, I'm going to, if someone asks you something, you don't know, oh my God, I didn't know what to say. So I, well, you know what, Bob? I'm not sure about that part and I'll have to look into it and get back to you. I'll do that offline. Here's what I do know. Boom, you don't take, you don't pump the brakes around it. You keep moving forward on that. How does Rachel Maddow do that? First of all, she of course is brilliant. Uh, there's no arguing at that, but she forever has experts on who know a lot more about a topic than she does, but she always sets it up and says, now she'll talk to David Kessler, right? Of the, you know, about health, about something to do with COVID. And she'll be like, here's what I, you know, da, 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 da. She does the whole stuff. She goes, Dr. Kessler, is there anything I said that was misconstrued or incorrect that you would like to set the record straight about? Or is there anything, she'll say, is there anything I missed out, missed? 
no, Rachel, you pretty much got it. I mean, that's usually the answer. That's the right answer. But sometimes people go, well, one thing, Rachel, I would add is what she's doing is a kindness. She's not disclaiming. She's asking for clarification. That's not what she does because she's a woman. That's nothing to do with that. It's about um, clarifying. So uh, when she does that, that's how she does it. She does it with muscular language. She is cogent. She is clear. You can use muscular language too. And it doesn't mean tough guy. I'm not saying you have to emulate someone else's personality. This is taken directly from that piece I'm going to send you. Find your voice. Instead of saying something like, how about, why not say, I strongly suggest, you know, own your idea. I think maybe, no, my strong advice is. And rather than just saying, yep, yep, I agree. I agree. You know why? Put more flesh on the bone of your responses. That's what muscle is. It's flesh on the bone. That's how you take up more time. If you're going to pop in to say you agree, say why you agree. Add that and you add something valuable. But I would be mistaken if I didn't point out that it isn't just saying the right things and the perfect things all the time. No, it's also about listening. You don't need to do wall-to-wall talking in order to say something of value. In fact, it really behooves you to listen rather than worrying about what am I going to say, what am I going to say? Listen closely to what people are saying because it lets you hook right on to what they just said. You don't have to talk all the time to have an impact. The more closely you listen, the more you'll have to say. In fact, this kind of made me laugh. This is a piece in the Harvard Business Review. Are you really listening? Which is just hilarious. They had a lot of pictures of animals with big ears, which I thought was genius. But it was basically a story about, oh my God, there's a story about a male CEO who didn't listen and he got in trouble. Really? Um, so yes, even Harvard Business Review, Review is coming around to the fact that sometimes it's really important not just to have an opinion, but to listen. Who knew? This is a piece from that. It's worth uh, quoting. Listening involves far more effort than most leaders realize. Executives often trap themselves in information bubbles, a result of their overconfidence and outdated ideas about leadership. They believe they're a step ahead of everyone else. Brings me to my next point. Why do people interrupt you? Why do people interrupt any of us? They think they know what you're going to say. I have done this. I'm guilty of this. I think I know, so I'm going to save time and speed up. And and sometimes I know I do this and it's not great, but it's a way of making someone feel heard before they've said anything. It's a reverse echo. That's why I think sometimes people interrupt. I know it's why I do. Sometimes they're trying to help. And other times someone doesn't want to be questioned. And so they're trying to hold on. They don't want to lose the floor. So if this happens to you and you're in the middle of speaking and someone does step on you on a Zoom call, there your box is lit up and then someone else's box lights up. I think we've uh, gotten to a point where some etiquette and you know, I go, okay, well you talk because it's like single channel, right? You can only hear one person at a time. If you see someone trying to pipe up, you can keep talking and retain the control as you're talking and you acknowledge it. Bob, I see your, you have a point. Let me wrap up this and I'll hand it right off to you. Uh, let me just, I'm just going to complete this sentence here. I complete this thought and then I'm coming to you. I'll let you have the floor. It's kind of like when you, you love when a table server who's very busy comes by and says, I'm slammed. I will be right with you. At least, you know, your turn is coming. That's all Bob wants is to know his turn is coming. Or sometimes you get interrupted. Literally someone cuts you off mid sentence rather than fight. And it's a case by case, trust your gut here, pause let them finish and wait for the land animal to run out of air. Even the biggest blowhards run out of air. Pause and pick back up. Wait till they take a breath after they've so rudely interrupted. One point, Bob, before we move on from this. One, and one point before we move on. This brings us to emotions because I know that it calls up all kinds of feelings. And sometimes not just does it cause feelings when we get interrupted, but we are feeling passionate about a topic. And, and this has been a criticism of women when the studies that looked at women is like, oh, they get emotional. Blah, blah, blah. This of course is annoying, right? Like, oh, well, women are emotional, please. Uh, no, that's not the point. But how are we using emotion? Because sometimes they can work against us. Getting someone else to feel something is strategy. You create a certain kind of ad campaign. You have a point to make. You have a beginning of your talk. That's not devious. It's called strategy. This is how I, I want to help encourage a feeling. 
But when your own feelings get in the way, think of it as static on the line. If I'm so caught up in feeling defensive or I'm so whatever emotional that I can't actually communicate, I'm in the way of my own point. Never let feelings get in the way of your own point. Sometimes a little bit of being choked up at the moment might actually, whoa, people all tune in, right? We, we, we are like heat seeking missiles for emotion. Um, but just be wary of letting that get the best of you. So the way I think about this, channel passion, elicit emotion. You have feelings, use them like gas in the tank, but use it to make sure you get your point across because the goal here is to be heard, not to have a forum for your own feelings. Tolerate some tension. I know that that's uncomfortable, but sometimes, and women, I'm looking at you because I've seen more women do it than men. There's a race to fill space if there's tension. Well, I don't want to get that. We go into soften like cotton batting. Like we want to soften the edges. Test yourself here. Try it. Don't rush in to soften it. Resist the urge to cave on the spot or fill the space. Silence is definitely and deafeningly powerful when you're speaking. So if there's space, maybe you let it hang there for a sec. Someone will rush to fill it because nature bores a vacuum. Uh, but that's something you can use to your advantage. Be wary of where your feelings are causing you to be afraid and to justify and disclaim and fill. Be wary of, of our, we all have that tendency. And the last part of this is to think like a talk show host. Look at how lovely Stephen Colbert and Lady Gaga, what a loving exchange. You don't need, a, look, if you're the host of the meeting, you're the person leading the meeting, your job is the host. You, it's your job to make sure everyone's heard. Absolutely. But even when it's not your meeting, you can kind of be the host. I don't mean usurp the power of the person whose meeting you're attending, but I do mean making sure you treat people like they were your own talk show guests. Back to what we said earlier. Take care of your guests. Make sure they've been heard. If you don't have a big opinion to share at the moment, sometimes it helps to go in. Um, and I don't mean mansplain someone, but you're reflecting back to them to make sure you understand reflect back and add on. Joe, I hear you saying that you're uncomfortable with the way we've handled X, Y, Z. And I will add this. I agree with you on that. Here's my challenge. Boom, boom, boom. That's how you get people listening. You're listening to them. You're responding directly to what they said. They are all in. But you don't start by disclaiming them. Joe, I don't agree with what you said because, oh God, oh God. Call out what's working. And this is what we're really going to spend the next hour on where you're actually going to put this into practice. Call out what's working. Not only don't just be the denier, the one who's like, well, that can't work because well, we can't do that. And there's always that person. I think it's either the worry wart or the person who feels the need to be smarter and show that we're not going to fall for that idea because we tried that last time. This is not a winning position to be in. Um, so my point is, when you highlight what is going well, it does change the tenor of a discussion and you become the source of that positive energy it makes a real difference in how people listen to you and pass the mic. When you have the mic and you've said something, this is your chance to hand it to someone who doesn't get to talk often or who you see is trying to get a word in, you know, blah, 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 blah. while we're on the topic though, I want to give Jen a chance because she and I were talking about this the other day. Jen, do you want to share something what we talked about the other day? Now, please don't put Jen on the spot. This is not about calling people, like calling the student in the back who's been snoozing the whole time. You, de you never want to put someone on the spot. In fact, if you know you want someone to speak up in your meeting, you tell them you're coming for them the minute you get the floor. It's a powerful way to get people in. It's a generous way to use the spotlight. Use questions purposely, not reflexively. This is very nuanced but I'm pretty sure you can handle it. Uh, Deborah Tannen says, how and when questions are asked can send unintended signals about confidence and power. I know you probably have questions, by the way, jot them down, we're gonna get to them. How you ask a question does determine how people see you. When we use questions reflexively, like, ha ah, like scary, like a oh, knee jerk, it can come off as unsure, unaware, unprepared, unwilling to stake a claim and fearful. That's not how we want questions to come across. We use questions purposely. I'm not saying don't ask them. You can and must ask questions in a discussion of any kind, 
but use them to redirect or prevent redirection, keep us focused on the topic, to hit pause on a topic, to pivot. I understand the concern, but my question is, how are we going to do this for this group? It doesn't even sound like a question, does it? I'm opening up a window for discussion. It can raise critical issues and it can be about getting clarification. Dr. Kessler, would, would you mind uh, telling me if there's anything I missed out when I set up the context of this conversation? Ask yourself this, where can you adjust the phrasing of your questions and make statements instead? Instead of, I'm not clear, I'm not clear, I don't know, I don't, I don't understand. Like there's a way that that can come off just not well, you know? Try using something I would advocate against in written word. It's a little bit passive. It doesn't seem clear yet why this. I'm not sure I'm understanding and here's why. See the difference? It's a big difference. And lastly, make Zoom work for you. You're not new to this game and I know it, but I'm telling you, if you're not doing this yet, do it. Record your calls. I record 99% of all my calls, even one-on-one -on -one calls. Number one, because I wanna be able to go back and see what I said, sometimes I forget, but also review them. Go back and look at a group discussion you were in. Watch it. Yeah, I know it's hard to watch yourself in a conversation. I get it. But what happens? Watch the conversation now that you're not in it. Where does the power go? What's happening in that conversation? You can learn a lot by studying it. And now we actually can rewind things and go back and look. Look for excellence and point it out. I would not use a recording to embarrass a colleague or a team member, right? I would say, look at how you did that. That was genius. This can be really powerful for managing teams. Save the chat on a discussion and follow up with people who did not get a word in. You already know how to use the chat function. We are, if you're not using it right now, because I'm not looking at it, we're going to use it. It's a great way. Yes, it's passing notes in class. Now it's legal. Uh, share support throughout the discussion. Yes, I hear you. Yes, yes. Applause, exclamation point, blah, blah, blah. You can bookmark a point. Hey, I want to come back to this. So if someone's looking at that. They can see. It's a way of just putting it up there. Cue up a point you'd like to talk about next. You're giving yourself a runway to discuss a thing. Amplify others. Do not let it replace your actual voice. Now realize this is fantastic. When could you ever do this before? When someone else was talking, could you walk up behind them and stick a post-it on the wall and be like, yeah, when Bob's done, I got something to add to that. No, but now you can. This feels dorky, but I'm telling you, not only do you want to keep your camera on, but you do want to use... Uh, body language more because you're, you're restricted to just such a small little thing. So what a lot of people do now is this for applause. Yeah, it feels dorky, but I can't hear this when everyone's on mute. This is the visual. It, it reflects light. I can see it, you know, or, you know, this is dorky. I'll give you that. But the more movement, the more room you take up. And I'll tell you the, the biggest hack of all, <laughs> get a good mic. I'm using a mic right now that sounds, uh, hopefully it's connected and it's working, right? You can get a really good mic for not a lot of money. And I'm telling you, I have talked to people who were like, that's a great idea because most people, I don't understand people co contributing on CNN and they don't have microphones. You, if I don't have the mic on, you hear the echo of out here. It's diffuse sound. But if I'm right in on that microphone, I'm in your ear. That makes a difference. It actually can ensure that you're heard. I've seen it happen. Like when I'm talking and people listen because the sound is so unlike what their sound is. This mic is like 79 bucks. Again, I have a link for it or a version of this. They have all different kinds in the resources that I'll send you. It's an audio technica. It's not fancy. I bought it like a $15 arm to clip to the edge of my desk so I could put it right up under my pie hole so you could hear me. Makes a huge difference. Bottom line is this is not a zero sum game. You can go beyond being heard to having impact and helping others to do the same. Seth Godin, again, it's possible to take your turn on purpose. It's possible to change your approach and to choose to take your turn. And it is your turn. So where will you speak up next? How can you start speaking up with more courage and frequency? How can you participate and lead in a way that feels natural to you? How can you help others be recognized? Are strategies enough? Kinda, I told you some things. Doesn't help if you don't do them. Is setting an intention good? You could say that, but until you put the strategies into action, that doesn't matter. 
you could read a lot of books on surfing and feel like you know a lot about surfing, but nothing prepares you for the moment you're in that wave. And this is what a live conversation is. It's navigating something big and moving that could see you right through successfully or could swallow you up. And lastly, I will say I got this book, has nothing to do with anything, The Gift of Fear. Um, I was in my 20s and a woman living in the city, you know what I mean? Like I, someone gave it to me, I guess. And it was about how to use your intuition to avoid being the victim of a violent crime. Fantastic book. Changed my life, but not because of what I read in it, because of what I did. He references a, a, a self-defense program that's still happening today called Model Mugging. Very violent. I give you this is not what you saw or thought was going to be happening. But what you do is you literally fight. You see that guy on the left? He is a trained instructor who is fully padded. And we got to really hit. It wasn't like, here's what you should do if someone grabs you. I got to kick and punch and fight uh, with my full strength. And it changed the way I carry myself in public. It changed the way how I walk down the city street forever. And that was 20 years ago. My point is, have you given yourself the chance to see just how strong you are? If you don't give yourself the chance, you won't know. And that is what we're going to do in part two, where we're going to actually roll our sleeves up and do this. Uh, we're not going to get in a pretend fight in a meeting. That, that's not what's happening. <laughs> that's not happening. In part two, and then I'll go to your questions, we're going to um, practice speaking up in a safe and supportive environment, exploring your own voice without criticism and judgment. You're going to tap your intuition and creativity as a way to access courage and learn a new model for feedback and support that alleviates pressure to compete. This is part of a, a, an actual approach I'm trained in, um, and we will talk about that more. We're going to talk about the critic and the way that we think about feedback too. That's what's going to happen next, but I certainly have talked long enough, and now I want to go to your questions and the time we have left. So uh, you can wave a hand. You can um, put your face on the camera and wave or put it in the chat. I will call on you. Uh, sometimes people like that better because it can be awkward to jump in, but I do see Eric is highlighted there. Eric, how are you? Do you have a question for us? No pressure. I did not. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Who knows why? Just tell me about where anyone can, can contribute here. Tell me about, maybe you're like, well, look, I tried that and it didn't work. Maria, do you want to share? Hi, Terry. Um, I have a question. So I'm, I teach and, um, do you teach? I, I teach film at Emerson actually, and I'm also an alumna. Um, Terrific. my question is that, okay. So zoom and all of its wonders. Yes. So <laughs> I, and also like even teaching in class in person, right? With a mask and everything Terrific. like that. Um, so my students have issues uh, like sometimes replying back to me when I pose a question, whether online or in class. And then there's like this awkward silence that goes on for way too long. And so then I feel like I'm myself am you know, compensating for that silence. And I understand so my, that. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> my question for that is like, what, what does one do when like, well, if you Maria, pose a question and no one like is answering? Well, let's, that happens a lot. And that's, they need to feel the weight of that silence, you know, cause someone will always jump in and break it. <laughs> well, not always, but let me ask you this. Let's pick a situation. Where is this the biggest problem? Is it when you are teaching in a room or, or do you want to talk about virtual because virtual has its own problems as we established. Um, it could be either way, but definitely virtual. It, okay, so let's focus on virtual gaps. for a sec, because in person, you can look at their faces and say, now, one thing I don't know, obviously, is the question you asked. And it has everything to do with the question you asked, because if there's a right or wrong answer, no one wants to be wrong. If it's the kind of question that encourages, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to get the right answer given, that's a compliance question. Who has the right answer? If the question, the purpose of the question is to foster discussion, then, and realizing I don't know what it's for, what you're like teaching and all that, it's how do we lower the bar to responding? I did this myself. I did a, a, a workshop like this um, to the top executives at L'Oreal and all the women. 
and they, there is a sense of fear, corporate induced, right? Like patriarchal fear and distrust of each other. Uh, gee, I wonder how that happened. Um, but it does happen. And there was a long moment of quiet. And I, and I had said, I had posed a question, who would like to share? Now they were going to read something they'd written down. And there was a long question. And I said, guys, I get paid the same today, whether you answer the questions or not, if you share or not. But if we can't share here where we've established we're safe, how are you going to make change elsewhere? We need to hear from you so that we have someone to trust. Please, would someone let us, would someone trust us enough to let us trust them? And then a few people did speak up, but this doesn't happen overnight, right? So can you, um, one way to do this, and I've had people say on Zoom, they feel awkward speaking up. The great thing is you can go to the chat and say, why don't we see some stuff in the chat? What do you think? What's the like low stakes? How to get people to answer is keep it low stakes, low stakes. What do you think? What are, what are some ideas? And they can't be wrong. If someone answers once and they get cut down, no one will speak again. So then I'd say, what are some answers? Oh, I see some great comments. I see that and I would read the answers in the chat. And then, and then I would say, hey, you know, Bob, I see you put a really great comment there. Would you mind sharing out loud? Because now they've been affirmed that what they said is good. And now they're being encouraged to say it. And then when they say it out loud, that was great. And you know what I loved about what Bob just said? What a great answer. Oh, well, I want some of that love. Please sign me up for some of that love. We have to, if we want to encourage discussion and not make people be right and wrong, then we have to say things that are easy for them to answer and be right about. So that's something to think about in terms of how you phrase questions. Can you give me an example of a question that you might have asked or that you want to ask in your next class? And let's make it a question that they can't help but answer. Well, maybe like there's like an image um, on the screen. And so we want to dissect that image. Oh, perfect. So, okay. Yeah. So there's no wrong answer. Um, and I, but I think lots of students, especially my female students, are very self-conscious to look stupid or feel like they're wrong. Yep. So, um, so I, well, because they do, would... they're afraid of that, right? Like, what if I say yeah. something stupid? So what yeah. uh, sometimes when I'm going to do something like that, what I would do is I would offer my own silly responses. Like, what does that man in the such and such in this scene, what does he remind you? I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking of like, it's reminding me of my dad for some reason. It reminds me of this. If you make it silly and playful and easy, it can't feel high stakes, right? And you might say, you know, you want to be like women. Why aren't you we speaking up? You know, like Andrea, you should stand up for all women. It's kind of like, oh my God, the pressure. But what about if you had them write down some of the things they're thinking of? Like, let's just take a minute and write down some of the things that come to mind. Just totally free wheel association. Just write some things down. Great. Let's just hear from what you wrote down because then they have something to read from. It feels a little more secure um, and it can be and be like, let's just, you know, let's hear a bunch of them. Let, and it's like, I'll get it wrong. What about you? You, okay. Blah, blah, blah. Rather than one person speaks, another person be like, what do you think? What do you think? And if the men lead, great. Let them lead the women in. All right. What about you, Jess? What do you think? Seriously, give me the worst answer you can think of. Make it a challenge, right? But writing down because sometimes they, they draw blank. I don't know. I don't know if it reminds me of. And if they don't have an answer for that one, then you change the question. Also, in the beginning of the entire class, since you have them uh, for a semester, not just one day, we say, let's, you have to establish that early on. Let's just start talking from the beginning and let them talk from the beginning as often as possible. It's like, this is a terrible analogy, but I'll share it anyway. Clipping a cat's nails. You don't wait till you own the cat 10 years before you go in with a clipper. That cat's going to be like, uh, no, you're not clipping my nails. You start when you first get that cat, you touch their paws, you rub their paws, you kiss their paws, then you squeeze the paw, then you clip one nail. There has to be a familiarity with speaking. Do not expect your students to pop out and start talking and, and being, you know, riffing freely when that wasn't established from the beginning. And I'm not saying you didn't establish it. But in the next part of this workshop, we are going to get into how do we open up and make people feel that it's delicious to share their freewheeling observations. But Maria, thank you for that really thoughtful question. And I appreciate it. Uh, what else? We got some great comments in here too. Jay Adams, this is super helpful to write down things. Yes. Have them write it down. That's why I like the chat because it's already there and they've gotten pre-appraised, pre-praised, not pre-appraised. 
Uh, love that. You know, I see Maria has a, has a comment here. I love this guy. Would you please share? I do that with my group now. My group's very comfortable with each other. And I'll say like, hey, I see some great ones. Um, would you mind sharing what you just wrote there? Then they get practice saying it. Uh, Robert says multiple answers sometimes allows for the list written down to have more of a chance. Yes. One answer to stand for me might mean I'm stupid. What if everyone had to come up with three to five of the worst, craziest answers? Well, now the game's changed. Now it's come up with the craziest number of answers. Then you get stuff moving, right? What else? Where else? That's a great thing because a lot of you are in positions of leading. You are the hosts. Is there any place else that you felt stuck or felt weird about speaking up? And I know this is so meta because I'm making you speak up about speaking up and it's crazy, but is there anything else I'd love to help with? I had a question actually sort of bouncing off of that as a okay. sometimes. So often I'm facilitating a room where everybody has different dynamics. Everybody has different levels of experience, right? So there becomes mm -hmm. that comfort level of who is the authoritative voice in the room. And oh often, boy, <laughs> right? So I often try to take a moment, especially as the conversation goes on, to say this phrase that we've been trained over the years to say, Can we hear from somebody who hasn't spoken? And Where that's I, such of a diss, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's like, hey, loudmouth, shut up a minute so we can hear. Yeah, and I, I think it's a diss on both sides. It's a diss on like, shut up to this spoke, but also you aren't doing your part in this discussion. So I wonder if you have any tips of anchoring it's, those people yes. in a better way. Are you saying that the people who are not speaking up feel somehow inferior hierarchically to the person who does speak up? Are you talking in a group where some people get paid more or is no, this a group that is lateral? A group where I do not know these dynamics. So let's okay. Say so you're coming in as someone who doesn't know the dynamics, but correct. some loudmouth blow bloviating blowhards are taking up all the air in the room. Or facilitating something with a group of people from an industry, and I know some of them and some of them I don't know. But you can tell who's speaking and who isn't. So right. well, that's right, that's the problem. I don't know. It is so hard because. It's so obvious, not only who the people are, but there's like two or three people who will speak up. And it's not that no one else can get airtime. Everyone else assumes, well, those guys got it. They kind of sit back and they're like, they got it. I don't need to say anything. Um, I think that what, I, what I'm always careful to do is I never, ever want to make anyone feel ashamed or embarrassed for speaking up. Even like the ones who speak up a lot sometimes have the most fragile ego, right? So I think I would say we've heard some great stuff from from um, Bob and Louise and Jackie. And I love those points. I would love to hear even more perspectives in the room. Is there something that we aren't hitting? There's gotta be something else we're not hitting. So in a way, energetically aligning them with you so they feel they've been stroked, not, hey, can we just, can you shut up a minute? You know what I mean? Like, you know, like Maxine Waters, shut your mouth to Jim Jordan. Like, yeah, we can't do that here. Uh, but yes, to, there is a way to say, we love these things, but what else? I know, and sometimes I'll call it right out. I'll say, I know it might seem like, well, these people might know more. We are all at a disadvantage if we don't hear from everyone. In fact, I will not feel that I've done my job here today if I don't get to learn from, from more people than just a few that I've had the pleasure of speaking with already. Who yeah, else has something I, to say? Sometimes I feel for these people. Some people just aren't talkers, but I want to make sure right. that either my presentation or the dynamics uh, aware, unaware. Is it virtual? Isn't prohibiting them. Is it virtual? Uh, it's been in both situations. Okay. But I mean, like, the fact is you're right. Some people are like, don't make me talk. Kind of like if I go to a singing concert, don't make me sing, bitch. That's your job. Like you're up on stage, you know, like I get that. Um, and, I'll, and that's why I do like the virtual because I can say, you know, if you, you don't have, maybe you're not into saying things out loud, but uh, hey, we'd love to see some comments. And then you give them attention. Like I said, then they've heard their name. They've heard praise and they've been acknowledged. They may be more likely to then speak up after that. But you're right. We can't, you can't make someone talk, but we can gently seat our experts and say, these guys are working really hard, but I know there's other perspectives. And if you're feeling brave because you're on Zoom and you can see their damn names in person, you don't know them, it's hard. Hey, you, you're quiet, say something. Uh, you want to call their names. I'd be like, and I wouldn't just zero in on one. I might say, Ginny, Holly, Susan. And if you guys want to like soften it and broaden it, 
you know, low stakes in general and easy <clears throat> versus spiky and high stakes and who's right. Trevor, what about you? Thanks. Uh, so I do this thing where I um, want to overcompensate for the gender dynamics of American society and 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 <laughs> that's so, a tough job. <laughs> and so not, I I feel more hesitant to say something because I'm it would be me as a straight white man taking up airtime when there are ah. other people in the room who haven't spoken yet. So are you feeling like you shouldn't say anything because you're a white man? Yes. Oh, boy. Isn't it just interesting? Um, I really appreciate your sensitivity on that. But the goal is not to shut up all the white men. You know what I mean? Like, that's not if you were like, gee, I've been talking wall to wall in every meeting and no one ever speaks when I'm in the room. Here is your opportunity, Trevor. It's your opportunity to say things that you believe are worthy contribution. That is every human's right <clears throat> who's invited to a meeting. Mm-hmm. This is your chance to pass the mic. This is your chance to lift up the other people who do not get the attention. So you can say, and, and assuming, look, if Eric's walking into a room with people he doesn't know and he's been hired to go speak to a group he doesn't know, but if you're in a group of people who you know, uh, and even if you don't, there's going to be someone in that room, you know, I assume, and you're in the position of being a participant in mm-hmm. the meeting. This is your chance to keep a wider scope from outside that meeting. Who in that group is trying to do what? The biggest gift you could give Trevor is the power of the influence and privilege that you do have. And that means passing the mic. Mm-hmm. That means figuring out who in that group has stuff to say, and you're not doing it for them, but you can you know, a lot of people really do want, they want a champion in the room. In fact, if, if someone in the room was going to tell me I have a hard time speaking up, I'd say, make an ally, have an ally and say, listen, Bruce, you're really the one who people listen to. I have something to say, but I have a hard time speaking up. Could you at some point help me get into the conversation? Bruce would love that. They, this is your strength. This is the, this is the power that you have. What if you said, I have some thoughts, but you know what? I really want to hear from so-and-so. Not on your will, like you will speak because I call on you, but <laughs> who can you call on? Where can you share that mic? And, and it's in your power. This is the power you have. You being quiet doesn't help anyone mm. because you're assuming that you being quiet will mean that everyone else will automatically speak up. And you're talking about years and generations and decades of nope. Mm-hmm. You think you're going to change that by you being quiet for a day? That's like saying, if I, this is very violent. I don't know why I'm being so violent today. If I don't hit someone, there'll be less violence in the world. I'm sorry, but that's not going to happen by you not hitting someone. Someone's still going to shoot someone today. So you have to be, it's kind of like, I am no expert on anti-racism, but you almost have to be the advocate for what needs to be said by other people. And if you champion other people, you will be doing a service. Where can you use that power, Trevor, to enable others to be heard? I think that's something that you can do without feeling bad. Do you agree? Yes, I think so. Thank you. <laughs> the, we the, appreciate uh, that. And we want that. We want the, you in the room. Yeah. The, the, the hit, hitting analogy actually makes a lot of sense to me. Thanks. It's, it's terrible and violent, but it really does make the point. 